Welcome to our section on water, or more specifically soil water. We're going to have five lectures in this section. This one will give you a little bit of an overview of what the plant does with water, both shortages of water and in this section excesses of water and uh, we'll talk about that. So if you want some supplemental reading on this, uh, Soil Science Management by Plasters, um, chapters 7, 8, and 9 discuss this. Uh, Soil Science Simplified, uh, another book available on reserve at the library, uh, chapter 3, and then your textbook for turf, uh, Best Golf Course Management Practices has two chapters, both chapter 13 and chapter 15. So here's a picture that I really like of uh, George Thompson and Josh Weston. This is uh, one of the field trips that you'll be doing on Wednesday in the labs in here. And I'm going to take you on a little bit of a virtual field trip around Pinehurst to show you some of the effects of water uh, shortages and uh, irrigation problems in the Sand Hills area. So let's go with George to Forest Creek. And this is the ninth hole at Forest Creek. You can see the tees here. Hit your tee shot in this area. Um, and then the membership has proceeded to try to fill up this lake uh, which is the irrigation lake with golf balls. Um, you can see there some of those golf balls. Um, this is a few years back when we had a pretty good drought and when actually Bill Patton uh, decided to try to dig a well and also uh, to pull back irrigation in the fairways and you can see a little bit of that effect here. Um, and, and in my opinion, a little bit better playability, and I think that going to a little bit browner golf course is going to be the answer. Uh, Bill's membership, and Bill didn't like that, but he was forced to do that because, as you can see, this is the irrigation intake. So it's pretty hard to run any irrigation when your irrigation intake is underwater. So this was a pretty dramatic drought, um, and actually uh, these had to be lowered and move to center, more center in the ponds. But so irrigation problems abound when we have drought situations. And one of the main reasons we have big problems is stuff like this. Um, this is just bad irrigation management. We don't know. Who, I don't know who the manager is. Probably nobody knows this was installed. Obviously, a head was damaged. And you can see this area here is suffering because of this irrigation problem. Uh, you got to have somebody get out there like there's Kevin, and he's uh, fixing the heads. The heads at the college are very well maintained, and also good water management. This grass is not over fertilized or over watered, so the college does a great job. Uh, Andy runs a crew. Uh, Andy's a graduate of the horticulture program from way back, even before we had a turf program, and Andy does a magnificent job. Uh, with a little budget, uh, maintaining very adequate centipede grass for the college and for the purpose of what it's meant for. Mistakes are made, though, sometimes. Um, irrigating the, the plants when it's freezing out is probably a mistake. So uh, turning the irrigation off is probably one of the most important tasks that has to be done and it, to be remembered to be done in all irrigation situations. But irrigation is important. The plants do need water. Um, all plant cells and human cells, for that matter, are between 50 and 90 percent water. It takes 500 to 700 pounds of water to make one pound of dry plant material. That number is even higher to make a pound of beef. So water is very important to the plant. Um, water is very important to the plant for turgidity. When irrigation uh, when water is low, the plant will lose its rigidity, leaves will roll, and, and it will crumple up, which makes some sense. Um, water, H2O, is a part of the photosynthesis equation. Um, the plant is cooled through uh, transpiration and evaporation, just like humans are through sweating. Um, we can help the plant sometimes by syringing that, but we need to be aware that sometimes if we're using hot water, that's not a benefit. Nutrient movement, all nutrients move through the plant by passive 
water diffusion from a place of high matrix potential of the soil to a place of low matrix potential of the air. So when the air becomes more humid than the soil, that's what I liken to a heart attack in a plant. Plants don't have a heart. They can't pump nutrients throughout their own system. They rely on a transpiration, on a, on a moisture gradient from the soil being wetter than the air. And when this doesn't happen, we have all kinds of problems. And it's the universal solvent for all chemical reactions. Okay, very important to remember. Water is a polar molecule. That means it has charges. This OH on this side is a minus, minus, and the H plus is a cation. Actually, that's what we measure with pH. So if you go back to your chemistry review, the first section of this course, you will understand how water works as a magnet and it can pull salts, compounds apart, which makes it a wonderful solvent for all chemical reactions. So water is an integral part and necessary for the plant. It's also necessary or regulated in the plant by the stomata, by the guard cells. So when there's excess water, water flows into the guard cells. When the guard cells are full, they expand and they open this air space in the leaf, billions of them, which allow water to move out into the air. So through the plant, out. So this is the flow of water from the roots to the leaves out the stomata. When water is limiting in a drought situation, there's less water in the guard cells, which flows out, which causes this gap to shrink or close, which stops water movement in the plant. Hence the heart attack, but necessary to hold turgor pressure. The plant also has some other ways of regulating this. It does it through osmotic potential. If the plant pumps a bunch of potassium, K+, plus, into the guard cells, then water will rush into the guard cells and open the stomata. If it pumps potassium out, water will follow and close the guard cells. So very important, um, guard cells opening and closing by amount of water which also increases the oxygen and CO2 exchange in photosynthesis, and that's, those are equations you should be very familiar with at this point. Uh, if we close the guard cells, photosynthesis is going to decrease. Photorespiration will increase. Um, growth will decrease with these clothes. So this is a very important thing in the difference between warm season grasses, cool season grasses, and all plants regulating their moisture through the opening and closing of the stomata. So you really need to understand how that works, and we'll talk about that a little bit in lab. Maybe we'll get some balloons and show you how that opening and closing mechanism works. Here's a couple drawings that I well, one's a drawing and one's a scanning electron micrograph, and I love the uh, picture on the right. But what the plant needs to do, and it, it's a big math problem, is move water from the soil down here which is a um, place of high matrix potential, I guess, a place where there is water, to way up here at the top of this giant sequoia tree um, against gravity. So gravity is a force that's always working down. So we need to create other potentials, matrix potentials, uh, potential differences to do that. And, and the plant has all kinds of mechanisms through uh, adhesion and cohesion that help it move water through the phloem and xylem up and out of the plant. Mostly xylem, up, phloem, both up and down. But um, I love this picture. This is a, a, a picture of a plant leaf. Um, there's an ordinary cell, but here's a cell with uh, a stomata, and this stomata is closed, so these 
guard cells here on either side don't have as much water in there. You can see the nucleus, uh, you can see, see the stomata, and then you can see the chloroplasts in there. So magnificent picture. Um, if we were to pump potassium into here, we could open up that guard cell, but in this case it's under uh, water stress. So again, take a little bit of time, look at that, and know these vocabulary terms. We're going to talk about two wilting points in this course. We're going to talk about a temporary wilting point is when there's the plant's losing water faster than it's gaining water, and it can do stuff. that This is different from plant to plant. The temporary wilting point on bent grass is going to be at a much lower, much lower or much higher moisture content than the temporary wilting point on Bermuda grass. Permanent wilting point is going to be about the same. That's negative 15 bar. We're going to talk about that in the next section. But if the plant's losing water faster than it can take it up, it's gone to temporary wilting point. So grass at this point will begin to footprint. Uh, the leaves will roll. Um, we can get the plant to recover from this in a few ways. We can have a rain. If the temperature decreases, um, if the wind goes down, or more humidity. So that kind of seems backwards, but wind is going to pull moisture off the plant, and humidity is going to make it more difficult for the plant to move moisture uh, from the soil to the roots. So think about that stuff. Uh, temporary wilting point is not a horrible thing, but once we see some temporary wilting point, we know we're moving towards permanent wilting point, which is death to the plant. So now we're going to get into the heart of this section, something that's dear to my heart. I worked on a PhD thesis at NC State on this topic, excess water. So one of the unfortunate characteristics of human nature is people think if a little bit is good, if we water the plants a little bit, they're going to be greener, that's good. Maybe if we water them a lot, it's going to be better. Well, there comes some problems from excessive watering, and it turns out a, a lot of those are subtle. They don't show right away, so most turf grass managers are going to err on overwatering than underwatering, and this is a problem, and, and I think it's one of my missions in turf is to teach people, you, all my students, that overwatering is bad. It's bad for the plant and it's bad for the environment. But here I'm going to tell you about how it's bad for the plant. When we use excessive amounts of water, we create soil that's anaerobic. So we get not enough oxygen into the soil, which in turn leads not enough oxygen to the root, which in turn leads to root death, root dieback. Some of the reasons that roots pull back so dramatically in June, July, and August in North Carolina is because the soils go anaerobic. And there's a couple excess water. Water moves, air moves through water ten times slower than it moves through air. Oxygen moves through water ten times slower to a power of ten than it does through air. So water dramatically decreases the amount of oxygen that can get into the soil. This lack of oxygen uh, will make it so roots can't take up nutrients. Um, root rot diseases, many of the pythium root rots and, and a lot of those diseases become from that or summer bent grass decline or syndrome and uh, the plant goes into a physiological change that we're going to discuss in the next couple slides. It's very, very important and a vocabulary term you're going to need to know. So here's a plant, if you were an astute biologist, you would say, Professor Ventola, if we overwater rice, actually rice can live in a paddy. How, how can that be? How can rice have roots when it's always in water? Actually, the, the water is what does the weeding for the rice farmer. turns out South Carolina, uh, the Myrtle Beach area, was one of the most profitable, well, profitable during slavery, uh, places to grow rice. There were uh, 
you can imagine working these rice fields with the snakes and the horrible conditions. But they flooded these fields in, in South Carolina. And the South, South Carolina was one of the leading producers of rice in the world up until sla when slavery ended. Uh, nobody was willing to do that hard physical labor in the, in the fields, in the rice paddies, and uh, the plantations closed up. So Brook Green Gardens was a former rice plantation in South Carolina. So very close to here, uh, rice could be grown if somebody was willing to go out there and, and farm it and do the labor uh, of that. But uh, the history of history of South Carolina and slavery is uh, is tied to, to rice production and tied to the structure that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So a little bit about the anatomy of roots. Um, we've got cortical cells uh, surround the epidermis. The epidermis is the outside root hairs, which go out from the root to pick up moisture. The steel, right down the middle. We've got xylem tissue, protoxylem here. Xylem is moving water up. Phloem, that says moving water and nutrients up and down. So if we need to get something down to the root tip, like sugars from the leaf, that would go through phloem. Xylem is always going to take, xylem is like a continuous straw. It will take water up and through the root tip. So in order for the root tip normally to get oxygen, oxygen has to diffuse through the macropores. The pores that are not filled with water all through here, zigzags, and get down to the root tip. But what happens in rice, and the next picture I'm going to show you is a cross section. A cross section is if I took uh, a knife and slit this root into sections like that and cut it kind of like on a salami slicer, um, boom, 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 like that. The next pictures I'm going to show you are what happens in both rice and it turns out turf grass. And the structure I'm going to talk about is called the neurenchyma, A-E-R-E-N-C-H-Y-M-A. -E -E so normal parenchyma cells from the cortex are going to form this structure. So here's a cross section of a normal root. We've got xylem, we've got phloem, we've got epidermis, no wait, endodermis here, epidermis on the outside, and between that, all of these cells here are cortical cells, and you can count in a bent grass plant, this is a bent grass plant, there's about one, two, three, four, five across. This is a bent grass plant grown with O2. This is a bent grass plant grown minus O2. So what happened is we did an experiment where we grew grass hydroponically with oxygen bubbled through it, and then when we turned off the oxygen on half the plants, about there was a growth decrease for about three days, and then a, a spike in growth, and the growth grew fine. And I thought the plants were going to die in four or five days, and they kept growing and kept growing, and I canceled a vacation, and all summer long they grew. But when we took them out, and when we cut them and looked, what had happened is these normal cells had degenerated and created these passages. And it turns out these passages are filled with air. So the rice plant and the bentgrass plant form these structures. This structure here is called an orenchyma. And what those orenchyma do is they allow oxygen to get down to the root tip and for the root tip to grow. Okay. Interesting adaption. Useful for a plant grown under excess water. Problem is, if we induce this on a putting green, which we can by overwatering, structurally the root tissue breaks down. So if we increase the size, and, and these are about like honeycombs. So on a honeycomb structure, there's a lot of uh, research done on the strength of honeycombs. If we go from a one-inch honeycomb to a half-inch honeycomb, we can go from a strength of 10 to a strength of 100, to a power of 10. Well, what we did here is we went from uh, you know, 1 inches to 7 inches. So we decreased that to a power of 10 times 3. So 1,000 times the strength of these walls is lost. So if anybody walks on that turf, these epidermal cells will crush and it will sever the roots. 
So it's very interesting. Probably one of the best representations of this is if you ever go to a nursery green that has no traffic on it, and you take a soil sample, the roots are going to be incredibly deep, even if it's over water, because there's no traffic. So traffic added, overwatering and traffic together are death for turf. So if we can grow bent grass in water, and you'll see it sometimes around on construction sites, nice, healthy, beautiful bent grass growing right in the water with no oxygen whatsoever. But if we were to have people walk on that, it's, it's going to kill it. So it's, it's, the con it's the combination of traffic and a Rankoma formation that's the problem. So I recommend you use water judiciously, not overwatering, and then um, your bent grass will not form a Rankoma, not adapt to live in a bog, and be much more healthier uh, through the June, July, and August months. So again, this is a very important structure. You should know how to spell Arancoma, and you should know what that is. So if you have questions on that, please ask me in class on this Friday. <laughs> so our rice plant does fine uh, in, the, in the bog, but we still need to try to not have Arancoma form in our bank grass. And one of the ways we can do this that Tim knows, Tim out there at number two and, and drainage, it's a big part, a big way to keep oxygen flowing to your plants and resist or, or have plants not form a rankoma. So that's our first section. Uh, our next section will talk about how water moves through and the forces acting on water in the soil.